I'm uh, Mike Perry. I'm the executive director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. Uh, we have a friends group for the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center, co-located with the Army War College in Carlisle Barracks. Uh, tonight we have a, an interesting talk, one that uh, doesn't quite often get as much uh, uh, publicity nationwide that it should. Uh, and we have Colonel Eugene Frederick Scott as our speaker. He was born on October 14, 1935 in Miami, Florida and raised in Chicago. He attended A.D. Sexton Elementary School and Englewood High School, where he was a sharpshooter in the ROTC program. Scott graduated from Booker T. Washington High School in Miami, Florida in 1957. He continued in ROTC at Florida A&M University, where he graduated with a BA in political science in 1961. Scott entered the United States Army as a second lieutenant in 1962. In Germany, he commanded tank forces and was the principal staff officer for training and operations for the 8th Infantry Division Combat Ready Forces. Scott was responsible for the training of over 27,000 soldiers. He served two tours in Vietnam in, from 1965 to 1966 and from 1969 to 1971. Colonel Scott completed his 28 years military career as post commander for two major U.S. Army installations, uh, both uh, Fort, uh, Fort Stewart and Fort Monroe, with budgets in excess of $200 million. Scott was a favorite of General Norman Shorkoff, and he retired just prior to the Gulf War in 1990. After retirement, Colonel Scott joined Sengstack Enterprises, executive assistant to John H. Sengstack. Scott managed the company's five newspapers, and for more than 10 years, he served as general manager and publisher of the Chicago Daily Defender. In this capacity and in retirement, Scott has served on a number of boards and committees, including Bronzeville Military Academy, the Illinois Military Flag Commission, the Governor's Commission on Discrimination and Hate Crime, the Attorney General's African American Advisory Committee, the National Advisory Committee of the Institute of Government and Public Affairs at the University of Illinois, the Chicago Area Boy Scouts Council, and as chairman of the National African, uh, National African American Military Museum. Tonight he is here to discuss Unsung Heroes, Episodes, and Valor, the story of the 370th Infantry in World War I. Sorry, there's a typo on the lead slide. I had World War II, but it's really World War I. I would ask that you hold your questions until the end. There's a question and answer icon, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pass the questions on over to Colonel Scott. Colonel Scott, the floor is now yours. Uh, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Uh, it really is a pleasure and an opportunity to be able to talk about the 370th Infantry Regiment out of Chicago. Uh, this unit was the only all-black unit, combat unit, to fight in World War I. That was some unique challenges. Uh, some interesting things happened to the regiment as they prepared to leave Chicago, go down to Camp Logan in Houston, and prep up for their trip to Europe. One of the most interesting things that occurred for the 370th as it made its way uh, to Camp Houston, uh, Camp Logan in Houston, was that just prior to the 370th arriving at Camp Logan, there was a terrible race riot in Houston. And this sort of set the stage for this unit's departure from Chicago and entrance into the community uh, at Houston. You can imagine, here's a unit training up to go into combat and they have to deal with issues of race riots. What happened to soldiers that were guarding the Camp Logan uh, were mistreated in the community. They weren't being treated fairly. And this was their first experience in many cases down in the South. So these, this unit from the 24th Infantry that was sent to Houston to guard Camp Logan during the training of the 33rd Division out of Illinois. The important conflicts about this encounter was these soldiers had just had enough of the mistreatment and they armed themselves and went into Houston and 
retaliated against the police that had mistreated them. Unfortunately, 20 people were killed, 15 policemen and officials in Houston and about four or five, uh, four soldiers were killed. This again set the stage for the 8th Infantry Regiment coming down to Houston to prepare for the battle in Europe. Not a pleasant scene. The local community did not want them there. The soldiers were reluctant to be there. And this is supposed to be your final train up prior to departure. One of the many problems with the 8th and the 370th, soon to be the 370th, was sort of a lack of training time. In Chicago, they had an armory, but not really the space to do some of the crew training and no space to do any unit training. So in my estimation, these units sort of left Chicago going to Houston unprepared for what they would encounter once they eventually uh, got to Germany and entered the war. Not a, not a good scene. Uh, I looked at one of the training schedules of the unit while it was at Camp Logan. I saw no crew serve training. I saw no unit training on the training schedule. I saw some individual training and I saw some mandatory training. But in order to work the systems of uh, the combat systems of an organization like a regiment and how it interfaced with its higher headquarters, normally a division, you need to get out and practice those systems in sort of a realistic environment. And based on my investigation, none of this occurred during the time they were at uh, Camp Logan near Houston. Let me move back to this lack of training and lack of opportunity for these black soldiers to uh, participate in the military. We almost have to go all the way back to the Civil War. At the end of the Civil War, when the units were stood down and sent back to their home communities, there was no opportunities for black soldiers to be in the army. And at that time, very few states had militias that had uh, opportunities also for black soldiers. So the experience factor was missing. No opportunities to join a military organization. In 1869, the army decided it would try to fix that by having the army organize four units for black soldiers, the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and the 25th uh, Infantry Regiment. Those are the opportunities. And you can imagine they filled up fast because you had a lot of former soldiers around from the Civil War that were looking for jobs or something to do basically. And those units didn't have any problem recruiting black soldiers. The rest of the army was sort of off limits uh, two black soldiers. Again, those were the days where the policy was that those units would not be mixed. So once the black spaces were filled in those units, there were no other opportunities uh, for black soldiers. Well, the Illinois National Guard decided that they would start to bring in a company. Uh, slide two, please. So the unit at, at uh, Illinois was the 8th Infantry. At that time when it first organized, it was a company. And that company evolved to become the 8th Infantry Regiment. That regiment was formed in about 1898. And at that time, it went to the Spanish-American War as a regiment. Once the regiment had 
uh, finished up at the Spanish-American War. Their next uh, activation was they were sent down to the Mexican battle uh, uh, expedition to try to track down Pancho Villa. And they stayed there for about six or seven months. So they did have some organized uh, training in a combat environment. Spanish-American War, and then next was the Mexican expedition. So this unit now comes back to Chicago, getting ready for World War I with more experience than most army units. So that unit evolved into the full battalion, the, the 8th Infantry uh, Regiment. After the unit came back from, World, uh, from the uh, Spanish-American War, they really were operating as a complete regiment. They went to the border with Mexico and fought as a regiment and came back and began to train up for World War I, where they would also depart Illinois and be a fighting regiment. Again, few opportunities in the Chicago area for this unit to practice its skills in uh, combat maneuvers or operating combat systems, intel systems, or operational, other operational systems. Just very limited opportunity. Again, because of the racial prejudice at the time, the unit was not truly a part of the 33rd uh, Illinois Division. It was sort of just stuck out by itself. Did very little interaction uh, with the 33rd uh, Infantry Division. This was a handicap, as you could readily see. Uh, they couldn't mix these units uh, in training or any other environment. So you sort of just had to sort of wait and see what would come out of interactions uh, as a part of the 33rd Division. The 33rd took off and went to Camp Houston, uh, Camp Logan and left the 8th in Chicago. Main problem, the community in Houston was not ready to receive these black soldiers. They are still upset about losing their fellow citizens in the riot uh, uh, right out of Camp Logan. So not too happy to hear that these soldiers could still uh, come to Camp Logan. The issue is these soldiers were combat soldiers and would be armed uh, with weapons or rifles. Didn't play well in the community at all. Uh, slide three. So as the 8th Infantry was training up for France, the Army decided to change or reorganize its National Guard regiments. The Army formed two colored uh, all-black divisions. The 92nd Division made up of primarily draftees and the 93rd Division primarily made up of National Guard units. The 92nd was a fully operational division. It had all its logistical components and support elements to support a combat operation. The 93rd was more of a provisional unit because somebody had decided that they didn't need all of this logistics tail to support them because the plan, obviously, was they were going to be given to the French and used as 
regiments with the various French divisions. So off to France we go, uh, slide three. Four. Off to France we go, just a typical soldier uh, headed to France with his uh, Springfield rifle and uh, U.S. pack. So when the 370th arrives in France after a sort of rough voyage across the ocean, the Regiments were assigned to division, French divisions. One challenge ahead of them, and that was that they had to turn in all of their U.S. combat equipment, weapons, combat vehicles, machine guns, ammunition, all of this had to be turned in, and they were to be issued French rifles, French ammunition, French machine guns. Now, you can see the challenge. They haven't had adequate training as they trained up for France. And when they get to France, another factor is added to this equation. You're going to get a new rifle and you're going to get new ammunition, new machine guns, and we want you ready as soon as possible. Slight morale problem, slight challenge. Uh, they're, they're in a French organization. The officers are speaking French and they have to learn this new weapon in a short period of time. Uh, that took a little longer than many of the uh, leaders expected, but once the units made the transition with the new weapons and the new vehicles, things seemed to move pretty good. The, the 93rd with its four National Guard regiments, the 369th out of New York, the 370th out of Chicago, and the 371st uh, out of the Washington area, and the 372nd made up primarily of draftees that acted as fillers for that National Guard Regiment. The 370th worked with about five different divisions while it was in France. It settled down with the 59th uh, French Division and was fairly successful uh, as it uh, eventually got use of their weapons, got use of the French system, and began to understand a little more about the trench warfare. Uh, the French start to have a little bit more uh, confidence in the black soldiers. So things started to move along better. One of the another serious thing that happened to the 370th was that its commander, Colonel Franklin Dennison, who was the highest ranking black officer in the AEF, was relieved of command on 12 July 1918. So all this turmoil and things happening, you're going to replace, and Colonel Dennison had been the command of the unit for no less than 10 years. Uh, this created a slight morale problem within the regiment. It was said that he, he was, had an illness and had to be taken out of command. But many of you understand the racial implications here because command is command. And a lot of officers, white officers, were vying to command a combat regiment. 
and many of the captains were vying to command combat companies. But the rule was that no black officer could command a white officer. So as a result of that, the first one to go had to be Colonel Dennison, because he the he was the regimental commander and he could not have any white officers. Once he was taken out of command, a white officer became the commander of the regiment, and several battalion commanders and company commanders uh, came in, white officers came in to take those jobs. It just doesn't look clear and transparent. It just seemed to have some type of favoritism uh, reaped into that, that, that change of command. Uh, Colonel Dennison, when he left France, he came back to the United States and uh, went to the hospital at Des Moines. And on his way, he stopped in Chicago and the publisher, the Chicago Defender, uh, the paper that I worked with for many years, happened to be at the train station to get a story. And he said he saw Colonel Dennison run up the stairs and appear that he was okay. And he asked him, how you feel? And he said, I'm feeling great. So it was a little confusion about why did this change of command uh, or re relieve of command have to take place uh, when it did. Let's talk briefly about the, the fighting uh, in France. The 370 served in sort of a quiet sector for, for, for training and, and to get accustomed to its weapons. And after that was felt that they were now ready to go, they were assigned to the French 59th uh, Division in the 10th Army, with which it participated in the Soissons Offensive and also uh, fought near the city, city of Vauxion. Where, which it liberated uh, from the Germans. The city had been taken over in 1914 and the 37th went in and uh, helped liberate that town uh, back to the local uh, folks. My wife and I got a chance to go to Vauxion and to go into the mountains where the soldiers have bivouacked, to go into the caves and see some of the markings that they had left in the caves. It was truly a eerie feeling to see those soldiers, uh, where those soldiers have lived and operated at, at, uh, right outside of Vauxion. The people of Vauxion were still praising uh, the liberation of that town by the 370th. I, you want me to I, go I, to I, Mr. Colonel Scott? Yes. Okay. This one or the, this one? Uh, that one. Okay. This is uh, some shots of the ceremonies that we had at uh, Vauxion to, to celebrate the 370th involvement in combat in, in that town. And they just wanted to recognize those soldiers and were very happy that, that, that we could come and participate in this ceremony. The significant part of the participation was the wife and I got a chance to take about 40 students with us to participate in those ceremonies at Boxion. A color guard from the Chicago Military Academy and a jazz band from the Martin Luther King High School. Uh, it, it was just a tremendous experience to see those kids' faces. Many of them had never flown on an airplane, less alone flown across that big ocean. 
yes. And uh, we have to thank Colonel uh, Jennifer Frisker and the Frisker Museum Foundation and also the McCormick Foundation for their contributions to help to take those kids there. That'll be something they remember all their lives. Uh, it was an interesting uh, experience by one of the band leaders, the French band uh, director. She said her grandmother had told her stories about when these American soldiers came to Boxion and played the jazz music. And as I watched the current jazz band and some of the French kids, both girls and boys, just look at them with such awe, I can imagine uh, the reception that they had received 100 years ago because it was the same type of reception that they received uh, today. We also had an opportunity to visit uh, the American Cemetery and have a ceremony there for those soldiers. I think we had 60 soldiers buried in that cemetery that were uh, killed in action and their bodies were buried right there in France. So we got a chance to pay a tribute to those soldiers for that, for that great contribution. And, yes, and also we went up to uh, Chantrude Farm where an, an incident had taken place where 41 soldiers from the 370 was killed in one engagement. They were attending mess, and the Germans who had occupied that location for many, many years probably had all those coordinates in their guns, and they fired on this bond and killed 41 soldiers. The first thing that came to my mind again is training. What about tactical feeding? You, you know, it, just some things because of this lack in confusion and training, uh, got the regiment in some difficulties. And uh, while on the other hand, there were many he heroic type incidents, uh, PFC Cuz was a soldier that, uh, PFC Cuff was a soldier that received a Distinguished Service Cross and was put in for a Medal of Honor for his bravery at uh, 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 Mount Descens there near Boxion, where he was uh, as a messenger moving through machine gun fire and artillery fire all day. And then finally, he succumbed to some wounds he received late that evening. So a lot of, lot of great heroics from the regiment and they did a great job fighting. They lost about uh, 150 men were killed and they had about 500 wounded. The French decorated them with about 71 uh, Croix de Guerres and the US gave them 21 Distinguished Service Crosses. And we are now looking at uh, how we can upgrade some of those Distinguished Service Crosses to the Medal of Honor. There's a committee that is examining that right now to try to upgrade these, these medals uh, for, for soldiers. Uh, five or six soldiers were recommended for Medal of Honors, but uh, only two soldiers from those black combat units received Medal of Honors in World War I. You ready to go to some questions or uh, wanna go to some questions? Anyone have uh, questions? Please go to the question, and I, uh, question icon on your screen and, and submit them. Um, Colonel Scott got, got one at Camp Logan. Camp Logan now is Memorial Park with a golf course down in Houston. 
Oh, uh, is that? <laughs> uh, not well noted. It, it, I used to live down there for a while, but I never really saw much uh, highlighted that it had been a training ground during the First uh, World War and, and a, a location for, uh, uh, for some of the black units. Why do you think that is? I, I think the locals really wanted to forget what happened at Camp Logan. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier, 15 policemen were killed. And I, I just think it left a very dark stain on the community and it's something they wanted to get over. So uh, it's just not a lot of uh, attention brought to it. Okay. Um, another question talked about, asked about, uh, you talked about the officers in France, uh, but when it was the 8th Regiment up in Chicago, were all its officers black? It, that is correct. They were all black. The first white officer was Colonel Roberts on the 12th of July in France when he relieved Colonel Dennison. So that was a little shock to the unit to have a white officer come in when since their existence they had been commanded by all black officers. It was a unique unit in that it had a lot of professional people in the unit from the local community. So it was probably one of the most outstanding uh, units because it had doctors and lawyers and teachers and businessmen as soldiers in that particular unit. Uh, any noteworthy people that, if we didn't talk about their military experience, any, any, any noteworthy veterans of that unit that later on went on and get, did real good things? Well, one I can think of, a Chicago guy was the first, was one of the most powerful black congressmen, William Dawson, was, was a part of that unit. So, but Dawson is one of the most famous individuals that came out of the, uh, the 8th and the 370th. Okay. The armory, another question. The armory was up, you said, in Chicago. Why didn't it, where in Chicago is it, was it located? And uh, uh, where, did, where did they have an opportunity to train? Was there no training areas in the, in the region that they could go to? There were, there were none in the proximate regions that, that they could go to. Uh, it, was, it was quite a feat to to try to bring that unit together to, to go off to training. So it was very infrequently done. Yeah, uh, now the, um, the Omri is located uh, right in the heart of Bronzeville. And it was the first black armory for National Guard soldiers that was built in the United States. And it stayed there for many years. And in uh, about 2000, we rehabbed it and renovated it and turned it into the Chicago Military Academy. So today it's the home of the Chicago Military Academy whose cadets I took to France with me. Okay. Uh, when the cadets were in France, did they go out and find some of the graves? Yes, they did. We spent some quite a bit of time at uh, Soisin Cemetery where the American Cemetery where those 60 graves are located. So we got a chance to, to go and find, they had already identified where they were. So uh, we got a chance to see some of the graves and some of the uh, cadets uh, and the band members had relatives that were in the 370s. So it was, it was really moving that uh, we were there uh, in period uniforms for the military academy. The color guard had uh, World War I period uniforms. And it just, it just was a very moving and colorful program. Somebody asked a question about the, the, uh, the image behind you on the wall, the print. Oh, yes. One of my favorite prints, that is the 10th at Cuba, San Juan Hill. So in the, the 10th Infantry or the 10th Cavalry? The, that's the 10th Cavalry. Okay, one of the historic black uh, cavalry units? 
one of the most historic black cavalry units that uh, helped in this photo save the commander's life. And one of the soldiers was recommended for not the Congressional Medal of Honor, but the Medal of Honor that they had at that time. Okay. I think eventually that unit wound up being at West Point helping train cadets on horsemanship. It sure did. Yes. They, they, they also, um, that was a unit in Vietnam that was associated with the 10th. Um, let me see if there's any. Um, where can, this history doesn't seem to be well known. Is it taught up in the schools in Chicago? No, that's one of the things that we are working on, getting some of this into the curriculum and the school. Uh, I, we, the, the wife is working with the media department at West Virginia University, and they're putting together some programs along with Google that we will transport out to the local schools in Chicago and at some point in time, take it nationwide. Okay, what's he got here? We got, we, we need to go back to one of your images, I think. Somebody asked a question about the uniform. So I'm gonna pop up that screen because I think your first image, oops, there it is. Right down here, the memorial that they have up in Chicago. Oh, okay, the memorial, the Victory Monument. Right. Yes, beautiful monument that was built in 1927 to commemorate those soldiers that were killed and also had served in France. So we got the names of 142 soldiers on that monument and also the battles that they fought in France. What's wrong with the soldier though? What's, what's, what's wrong about his uniform? We talked about it when I visited. What type of helmet's he wearing? Oh, they, they were wearing the French helmets. Right, and that, that, that statue still has the American Doughboy helmet, right? That is true. So and we, we, we fought that for a little while, but we didn't, to know we didn't win that battle. But uh, what was the difference? What was the small arm that the, uh, the infantrymen carried in the French army? Well, they carried the LaBelle rifle and the Berthia rifle. Those were the small arms that they carried. And it depending upon which regiment and the availability of those two weapons, that's the weapon you got. But most of the soldiers uh, uh, got the Berthia rifle because it was a newer rendition of the French rifle. The LaBelles, uh, there weren't too many of those uh, in the regiment. And, and I think the machine gun with a shell shell? That is correct. By all attempts, was not liked by anybody because it kept on jamming. <laughs> It kept on jamming. The French didn't like it, and certainly the American soldiers didn't like it. So that, that, those are two points of contention about that weapon jamming so easily. What else was different between the uniforms when they got outfitted by the French? Well, they were outfitted with primarily combat gear. The we weapon, the uh, gas mask, the, uh, the web gear that they had on was all French and they they were issued a French uh many of the soldiers were issued a French overcoat because a lot of the, the French overcoats were used to carry ammunition and things like that so they they also uh were issued French overcoats but you had a a mixture of uniforms because there's no supply channels for American anything food rations nothing everything was you came from the french all the supplies and uh, obviously i think the army knew that and they uh they, they just figured it was the best thing to do the easiest way to make it work was to use french ammunition and french gear and french weapons what do they think about the food any any diary entries out what do they think about french food they didn't like french food the french served a lot of soup and as you know, our soldiers used to eat meat and potatoes. Okay. <laughs> and they weren't happy with the French food at all. Okay. If someone wants, sort of last question, if someone wants to find more information about African-American troops 
and soldiers during World War I? Where might they go? Well, one of the uh, key resources would be uh, Arthur Sweeney's book on World War uh, One, Black Soldiers in World War I. Uh, he had a very unfiltered approach to talking about the, the war. There's very little in the World War I uh, uh, book that was issued by the military. Uh, but Sweeney's book would be, a and, and uh, Emmett Scott wrote a book about the black soldiers in World War I. So those would be the two primary sources that you get information about these black regiments that fought in World War I. Okay. Sir, what else would you like to add before we close? Uh, there's a, there is a, a documentary that I would like you to take a look at, PBS, and it's fighting on both fronts. And it gives a very good summary uh, and a historical perspective about the 370th and its battles in France. Okay. And it sounds like the experience of African-American soldiers in World War I was not much different than some of the issues they will face 30 years later at, during World War II. And, and that's true, very, very true. Uh, you know, in World War II, you had a double B campaign. But you had something very similar because they were fighting racism in its ugliest form in 1900s uh, and also uh, fighting the Germans and preparing for war in Europe. So it was a, it was a, a, a two front battle. Okay. So anything in final conclusion, sir? Uh, my research caused me to want to just mention the courage and the valor of these soldiers under these unusual conditions to be dedicated and loyal to their country and to their military organization and gave it the best fight that they could possibly give it under the circumstances. So uh, my hat's off to them. Well, thank you, sir, for spending some time with us tonight. Sometimes I'd like to drag you down here to Carlisle and let you see what we're doing here and maybe give us an input about how we can better tell that story. I would love to do that. Okay. It was, it was my pleasure and honor. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. All right.